Well, welcome everybody to the Legislative Audit Commission and also Happy New Year. Let's uh, kick it off to a roaring good start. And um, we have um, the, uh, I just officially for the record here, getting a little rusty, it's only been how long, but uh, today being Wednesday, January 15th. So um, the Minnesota Department of Health Office of Medical Cannabis um, is going to be our first report. And Mr. Nobles, I understand that you're going to be or having uh, Ms. Uh, Bombach presenting today? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Well, with that, why don't we just go ahead and get started and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. For the record, my name is Jim Nobles. I'm the Legislative Auditor. And yes, we are here to present to you two financial audit reports from our schedule of control compliance audits. Uh, first will be the state's medical uh, cannabis program, and Ms. Bombach is going to present that. She was the director manager of that uh, audit. And then we will have a report on the regenerative medicine program that the legislature is funding at the university uh, in a partnership between the university and Mayo Clinic, and Lori Lyson will uh, be presenting that. So I'll first... Uh, and, and, you know, it, it dawned on me that we have kind of a, um, a medical theme today yes. <laughs> with, <laughs> with regenerative medicine and uh, medical cannabis. I don't think we planned it that way, but uh, that's the theme. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Bombach. Welcome, Ms. Bombach. You can just go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Valerie Bombach. I'm an audit director within the Financial Audit Division. Todd Pisarski and Kelsey Carlson also worked on this audit of the Office of Medical Cannabis. So why did we do this audit? The medical cannabis program is relatively new, and since its creation in 2014, OLA has not audited the program or its technology systems, mostly because it's a much smaller program. However, there is now increased enrollment and demand for the availability of medical cannabis. In fiscal year 2019, there were a little over 17,000 patients enrolled. The Office of Medical Cannabis within the Department of Health oversees the medical cannabis program. And this office uh, enrolls patients and healthcare practitioners. It verifies the eligibility of caregivers for patients and also collects patient registration fees. The Department of Health also oversees two in-state manufacturers, and they are Leafline Labs and Minnesota Medical Solutions, uh, that the department approved these manufacturers to cultivate, produce, and dispense medical cannabis for Minnesota's program. Under federal law, cannabis is classified as a controlled substance and cannot be transported across states. And because of this federal restriction, the program requires the use of product that is grown within the state. The manufacturer's role is that they must provide a reliable and ongoing supply of medical cannabis for program patients. They have to assign any medical cannabis, uh, pro they have to process any medical cannabis plant material into an allowable form, and they have to assign a tracking number to its product prior to its distribution. The two manufacturers also must contract, also must each contract with a qualified laboratory approved by the department to test their medical cannabis products for various elements, such as content, contamination, and stability. And so beginning in mid-2015, the Office of Medical Cannabis approved two laboratories to do this. And these are Aspen Research Corporation and Legend Technical Services. This map shows the manufacturer service regions in dispensaries as of July 2019. At that time, each manufacturer was limited to one manufacturing location and four regions within which it must operate a pharmacy dispensary to provide medical cannabis. So medical cannabis is not dispensed through a typical pharmacy. It is dispensed through the manufacturer's own dispensaries. What is medical cannabis? Uh, medical cannabis is derived from the cannabis plant. And in Minnesota, it's administered in the form of a liquid or pill. It's vaporized with the use of oil or liquid, or it's in some other form that is approved by the Department of Health. Um, in Minnesota, it does not involve the use of dried leaves or plant form, and it may not be smoked. This drug is available to Minnesota residents whose health care practitioner certifies them to be suffering from certain conditions, for example, cancer, multiple sclerosis, or seizures. 
<coughs> for this audit, our objectives were, were to determine whether the Department of Health had adequate internal controls and complied with significant legal requirements. Our audit scope included the Department of Health's oversight of the eligibility processes, <coughs> participating healthcare practitioners, and fee revenues. We also examined the department's oversight of manufacturer and laboratory processes to ensure a tested and reliable supply of medical cannabis for patients and to timely detect diversion or loss of the drug. In our work, we didn't conduct a comprehensive audit of the manufacturers and laboratories or their compliance with legal requirements. So we focused on the department. What did we find? We looked at this new program in light of the increased enrollment and demand for medical cannabis, and overall we concluded that the oversight, the foundation, the processes, and the systems really needed to be tightened up before any large-scale expansion. We concluded that the department generally complied with most legal requirements that we tested, although we noted some exceptions that were related to the authorization of healthcare practitioners, some fee payments, and manufacturer contracts. However, we also concluded that the department's internal controls over the program were generally not adequate. The control weaknesses we identified were related to authorizing participants, processing fees, tracking and testing medical cannabis, and detecting diversion of the drug for unauthorized purposes. I'll start with our findings related to authorizing patients. So when certifying new patients for the program, the department must validate that the patient's healthcare practitioner is eligible and that their license is active and in good standing. The Office of Medical Cannabis does verify the status of a practitioner's license with the respective board the first time it enrolls a <coughs> practitioner for a new patient. However, the staff do not re-verify when the practitioner approves another patient for the program or during annual renewal for the patient. So if the practitioner is already in the registry, staff do, new, do not ever recheck to determine if their license is expired or elapsed. The Department of Health told us, however, that they do check quarterly reports for disciplinary actions such, such as suspensions, but they aren't looking to see if the license is expired or elapsed. Next, for the program, a patient may be allowed to have a caregiver, a parent or legal guardian to assist with obtaining and administering the drug for them. However, we found that the department lacks adequate controls to confirm the eligibility of parents or legal guardians and their relationship to the patient. In about 16% of cases we tested, the department did not have adequate documents or the documents did not conform with its own requirements for uh, verification. These exceptions were due both to weak documentation standards and also limitations within the medical cannabis registry system to hold and keep records. Um, and the, the registry also doesn't have an event log to log which documents may have come in. We have several recommendations to the Department of Health to address these particular findings. And I want to talk about the second item on this list, which relates to authorizing healthcare practitioners. We think that the department should amend Department of Health rules to require a practitioner to notify it of a change in license status or when they discontinue care for the patient. Healthcare practitioners who choose to participate in the program have several obligations under law. One, they have to agree to provide continuing treatment to the patient for the qualifying condition that they certify and they provide an annual certification uh, for the patient if they continue to suffer from the condition. Practitioners also have to provide the Office of Medical Cannabis with patient records on an ongoing basis. We think that under these circumstances, a practitioner also should have to notify the department of a change in license status or when they choose to stop treating the patient. Our next findings relate to fee collection and payment processing. The medical cannabis program is supported through appropriations and also fees paid by manufacturers and patients. So patients must pay an initial enrollment and an annual fee to participate in the program. Most patients pay a $200 fee. However, the law allows that the fee is reduced to $50 if the patient receives certain types of incomes, including social security disability 
or supplemental security insur insurance payments, um, or if the patient is enrolled in medical assistance or Minnesota care. However, we found that the department incorrectly charged the reduced fee for other patients too that were not specified in law. And these included patients who the Office of Medical Cannabis identified as a disabled veteran, um, but also people who were at one point disabled, but because they reached full retirement age and now received Social Security retirement benefits, they were no longer eligible to receive Social Security disability. So the Social Security disability under current law, um, they, those patients are allowed to uh, pay a lower fee. We have some other findings that the Office of Medical Cannabis was unable to fully reconcile fee revenue for cash and check payments between the program's uh, various accounting systems. That's their internal accounting records, the patient registry, and the state's accounting system. And this was because of technical limitations in the registry system, which only has the ability to clearly record electronic payments. Um, and so here, the Office of Medical Cannabis has to maintain a separate log of manual and cash payments, uh, manual check and cash payments. And so that's where the challenge is with uh, clearly tying out all of their the payments. Um, the Department of Health also did not resolve some separation of duties issues that were previously identified by the department's own internal auditors. We have two recommendations to the department in how they collect and reconcile fees. But again, I want to focus on a recommendation that would be to the legislature, which relates to the fee rates. Again, we think that according to law, the Office of Medical Cannabis should not have granted the reduced fee rates for some patients. And to partially address, things, address this, we think that the legislature should consider um, whether disabled patients who receive Social Security retirement benefits should pay a reduced fee, and if so, amend state statutes accordingly. And so let me explain the issue here. There's a window in which a patient would have been certified as disabled for Social Security disability, but when they hit full retirement age, they transition to Social Security retirement benefits, and that criteria is not listed under the law. Um, and when we are doing our review, it's our understanding that the patients have to be periodically recertified to receive the Social Security disability, but the department is not collecting that information. And for us, it's not clear if the legislature intended, based on these criteria, if there's a means test related to the lower rate or if it's based on whether they're disabled. So we think that the legislature should consider clarifying some of that language. Ms. Mama, while we're, while we're on that Madam question, um, in the meantime, since it's not permitted by state statute, correct. so is it your recommendation then that this practice stop and that they, in the meantime, go according to statute? Um, so our recommendation is, you'll see our first recommendation is they have to collect the correct fee from patients as defined in law. Yes, uh, Senator Benson. Thank you. Ms. Bombach, I hear, you know, not properly handling, not logging, not properly reconciling. Do you believe there's any material misappropriation or is this just we need to improve practice? There's no allegation that that money was diverted or anything of the sort. Ms. Bombach. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Benson, we actually did do a full reconciliation, which, which took some time, and we noted there was not a material difference. It was something like a $52 difference. However, um, the department is actually not doing that full reconciliation, and so we think, obviously, there's the risk, and part of it, again, is its limitations within the registry system, and I'll just mention that the registry system is actually a module, I believe, that was taken from the MET system. And so we do think that they need to clean up the system and, um, you know, I think it would benefit the department and I think they agree that they would like that improvement in the accounting system to facilitate the record keeping. Thank you, Ms. Bombach. We'll get to that, but I... Mm -hmm. You can go ahead. Madam Chair, our next findings relate to tracking and testing medical cannabis. First, 
Uh, the Department of Health did not ensure that each of the two manufacturers had a formal contract with the testing laboratory as required by law. Again, the manufacturers must provide a reliable supply of medical cannabis that's needed for the program and ensure that it's tested for such things as content, contamination, and stability. Testing the medical cannabis helps identify contaminants and ensures that the end product contains the appropriate dosage as prescribed by a pharmacist for a patient. Beginning in April of 2015, so it's mid-2015, the department approved for the manufacturers two laboratories to test medical cannabis for the program, and in fact, the laboratories have done so. However, Minnesota Medical Solutions did not have a formal contract with either laboratory until July 2018, which would be three years after the program began, and LeafLine Labs did not have a formal contract until this past May of 2019, which was after we started our audit. We think that the lack of a formal contract impedes the state's ability to hold manufacturers accountable for insufficient testing and to take corrective action, if merited, for any adverse reactions by patients who use medical cannabis dispensed through the program. The Department of Health also did not have adequate controls to ensure that the manufacturers accurately tracked and tested their product prior to sale. There are a number of requirements in law regarding how each manufacturer must assign and report to the Office of Medical Cannabis certain identifying information, such as a unique tracking number, which helps with inventory tracking of medical cannabis from its cultivation through production, testing, and sale to a patient. So a tracking number helps ensure a product has been adequately tested prior to dispensing, it allows for follow-up in the event of a patient's adverse drug reaction, and it facilitates inventory accounting to help detect diversion of medical cannabis for illegal purposes. From our audit, we found that we and the Office of Medical Cannabis could not independently track and verify within the department's medical cannabis registry that a medical cannabis product was tested prior to its sale, and this was for several reasons. First, the program relies on different information systems that are used by the Office of Medical Cannabis, the manufacturers, and the laboratories. Um, second, the manufacturers do not assign and use a single unique identifier to track a specific medical product from cultivation through production and point of sale. Third, um, the Office of Medical Cannabis does not collect complete inventory data uh, from the manufacturers and laboratories. And in fact, um, Madam Chair, the Office of Medical Cannabis has instructed the manufacturers to not report certain information that is required in law. Um, also, the Office of Medical Cannabis does not verify whether da the data are accurate, and we found data entry errors and omissions within the registry. We want to emphasize that uh, compliance with state reporting requirements and effective internal controls for tracking the medical cannabis is important. And members, I know that you frequently hear us talk about the importance of internal controls and weaknesses in internal controls. And here's an instance where clearly um, the, there were intended controls in place. Um, there are weaknesses in controls and in the implementation. In fact, there was an adverse reaction and an event here. Um, for example, during our audit period, the Department of Health issued an administrative penalty order to Minnesota Medical Solutions for dispensing medical cannabis that had not passed potency testing prior to sale. The department made this finding as a result of an investigation that was initiated from a patient complaint who reported they had used and experienced an adverse reaction from an MMS product. For our last finding, we concluded that the Department of Health um, also did not have adequate controls to help prevent and timely detect diversion or loss of medical cannabis by a manufacturer. The manufacturers are required to have preventive and detective internal controls in place, and the department is required to oversee the manufacturer's compliance with law. As part of its oversight, the Department of Health can conduct independent examinations of the manufacturer's financial and business affairs. Uh, they can look at their practices, they can look at the conditions of the facilities and the entities. It can also hire subject matter experts such as security control experts to do some of this work. We did find that the Office of Medical Cannabis staff has in recent years 
increased its unannounced inspections of the manufacturers where they, um, they do review the record keeping, the inventory, and prem premises. However, the department did not require a comprehensive independent examination of either manufacturer until March of 2018, which is nearly three years after they began selling medical cannabis. And in fact, they've only um, required one examination of one of the manufacturers. We think that the independent examinations can identify those pot potential risks and help inspectors, the MDH inspectors, target areas for uh, monitoring compliance with legal requirements. So they, the examinations will, would help identify risk and it would help guide the work of the uh, staff inspectors. Um, again, here, we think that had there been more rigorous oversight of the manufacturer's compliance in their internal controls, the Office of Medical Cannabis may have been able to detect a serious compliance issue that occurred at MMS. And here, um, in mid-2016, the Office of Medical Cannabis was notified that two MMS officers had previously transported MMS product across state lines to the state of New York, which is a violation of law. Um, uh, just some background here, a Wright County prosecutor subsequently charged the two MMS officers with intentionally transferring medical cannabis to a person other than allowed for by law. The case was, pre was subsequently disposed of through a settlement agreement that was approved by the judge. So here again, um, it's a case of weak controls allowed for an adverse event, and in this case it was diversion of the drug. These last recommendations are to the department in relate to tracking and testing medical cannabis. We think that the Department of Health should ensure that each manufacturer maintains a written contract with a laboratory to test their medical cannabis. The department needs to improve controls over tracking and testing medical cannabis in several areas. And in particular, we think that they should require accurate and complete reporting of tracking numbers and that they should routinely review the medical cannabis registry data um, to verify the completeness of the data and also verify that product is tested before it's dispensed. Lastly, the department should conduct more frequent comprehensive examinations. These would be financial and inventory examinations of the manufacturers to help prevent and detect timely diversion or loss of medical cannabis. With that, Madam Chair, I would be open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Bombach. Um, boy, that is quite a, a serious um, issues that um, are coming forward today in this particular program that are quite concerning. Um, members, um, we have a long list of recommendations and we also have, I think we really need to um, hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Health and their response uh, to this. Uh, they are on the agenda. Uh, it is what it is pretty much. Uh, if you want to ask questions on Ms. Bombach, you can do so now. If you want to clarify something otherwise, I would suggest we maybe go to the Commissioner and spend more time on the response uh, at this time. Thank so Ms. Madam. Bombach, thank you very much, but um, we'll continue to hear from you and I'm glad you're here to be available if there's anything more. And Commissioner, welcome. And again, these are some really a long list of some pretty serious things. So you have a good track record of, of um, working with things. So I'm hoping to hear uh, some of uh, your response to this, and if you want to just go ahead and start that. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Jan Malcolm, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health, and we very much appreciate the opportunity to respond to this uh, very helpful report from our perspective as well. Um, with me today is Chris Tholkas, who is the Director of the Office of Medical Cannabis. Um, also with me as resources for, for you, um, our uh, the Assistant Commissioner Marie Dotseth, in whose bureau uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis sits, uh, Deputy Margaret Kelly, who oversees uh, internal audit and financial management and many other things at the department, and Robert Mackey, who is our, our uh, Director of uh, IT at Health. So we can speak in some detail to, uh, to the specifics of the recommendations and what we've already done. Uh, really, again, want to thank the Office of the Legislative Auditor, um, Mr. Nobles, Ms. Bombach, for their work, 
in reviewing uh, OMC is our uh, abbreviation for the Office of Medical Cannabis Operations uh, from the period of July 6, 2016 to December 2018, as they've mentioned. I want to make it clear at the outset that we do concur with the great majority of the recommendations in this report and many of the issues that have been raised. We uh, agree with you, Madam Chair and members, that this is an important program to Minnesotans. It's got some uh, real nuances to it in terms of the public policy decisions that, that have been made and, and how we've operationalized those. And we know how important this is to the legislature, the governor, and the, and the people of Minnesota. Um, important to point out that, uh, again, this, the time frame of this report um, and our engagement with the legislative auditor have, have really helped to inform and prioritize some of the improvement work that we've been doing um, many of the issues in this report were the very same issues that we have identified through our internal audit work and through the program staff. And the good news is that we really worked very hard in 2019 on some of these very issues. So I'm happy to give you a status report on that today. Uh, but I just want to make a couple more points about the overall context of the program. Um, uh, many of you were, were here and were part of those policy debates that led to the passage of the law in 2014 that that enabled this program to be built for Minnesota. It was built in record time. It was just over a year between the passage of the law and the enrollment of the first uh, uh, participants or patients in this program. And we were really one of the first states to develop um, specifically this medical model around medical cannabis. And we do believe that this is one of the strongest medical models in the country. And we are looked to as a model for other states, trying to kind of distinguish that, uh, the zone in which we're all interested in understanding more about the therapeutic benefits of uh, parts of, uh, of, of uh, the, the cannabinoid uh, spectrum, if you will. And we're really proud of the fact that we've really prioritized patient safety and the collection of information that can help inform um, what we know about this. And the whole construct is that we're, we're treating cannabis as, as medicine in this, in this construct, and we take that very seriously. Um, there was and still is really a lack of established best practices for medical cannabis programs across the country. Um, uh, we have tighter requirements in Minnesota than is true in, in many states in terms of qualifying conditions, in terms of the requirements for patient eligibility, caregiver involvement, and provider involvement. And we think that that's, while that has created uh, access constraints around the program, we think it's, it's, uh, it's been an important um, design feature set by, by, by you all. Um, the medical cannabis program, uh, as you've heard, covers a breadth of activities that the legislative auditor has just reviewed around some of the operational aspects. Um, but the, the research program that's embedded uh, in the Office of Medical Cannabis is already very important uh, to us. Um, the patient and provider registration functions you've heard a lot about, oversight of laboratory mm -hmm. testing, inspection of crops, inventory control, financial audits, evaluation of new conditions and delivery methods. It's, it's quite an expansive task for a very small staff. Um, this, the program is small and it's self-supported through patient and manufacturer fees. Um, so it's had a staff of 12, as you, um, as you recall, and we're grateful for it. There was an, uh, an authorization for increased appropriation from the fee account just this last spring, which will allow us to add uh, three new positions to help, um, help, help the, the staff really keep pace with the growth in the program and some of the very issues that have been outlined today. I really um, want to say that uh, when, when I uh, came back into the department and had a chance to understand this work and meet the staff, I am grateful and, uh, and impressed by their dedication to the work and to, uh, and, and to patient safety and in trying to advance the state of the knowledge of, of uh, the, the benefits of medical cannabis. There's no denying, however, that there are significant challenges that come with operating such a small program. Uh, which was set up very quickly, and we're living today with some of the consequences of that rapid startup in terms of the information system support in specific. Uh, the program has grown very quickly, perhaps more quickly than, than you expected as policymakers, certainly more quickly than, than we expected from, a, uh, from an operational perspective. Um, and the constraints on the program are somewhat by design as a result of public policy decisions that have been made. For example, and a, and a really key factor in our, in our view, 
um, the, the law itself requires that there be two companies delivering this program in a vertically integrated manner, such that, that, that these two companies do everything from growing and cultivation and processing and, and, uh, and distribution of medical cannabis. That, that frankly does put us at some risk if one of those two manufacturers um, is unable to provide the supply that is, that is now being uh, promised and expected by Minnesotans. Um, that we work, uh, I think, in partnership with, with the manufacturers to understand uh, their issues as well as, as our obligations. Um, but it just, I just want to kind of point out the underlying kind of fragility, if you will, I hope that's not a, 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 a misstated word, of, of the system that, that is built around this vertical integration model. Um, it, it does, it, it makes us think about the, the right way to uh, to, inf to act uh, and, and the, this whole sanction model that, uh, that the legislative auditor has, has mentioned is, is, is a tool in our toolbox. And one of the reasons that we asked and you granted last year the ability for us to use a broader array of, of tools in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in our response. Um, because uh, the, the options of, of essentially putting one out of business uh, would create obvious uh, access concerns for the existing patient population. And of course, uh, as the uh, auditor's report mentioned, the very fact that cannabis continues to be a Schedule I drug at the federal level has made it really difficult to make this program as solidly evidence-based as you and we would like. The evidence um, is, uh, is emerging out of patient experience, doesn't come from a whole uh, long history of randomized clinical trials and, and the like. That said, we've really worked hard to build a strong program that does prioritize patient safety. And we couldn't agree more that internal controls are essential in everything we do. And, I, and I, in the two years that I've been back, I've really been grateful for the growth in our internal audit and controls program. Um, and again, many of the issues that the legislative auditor has, uh, has pointed out are, are the ones we've been focusing on for the last year uh, or longer, but uh, with increasing focus in 2019, um, specifically around what are the internal control process. Uh, for example, in August of last year, uh, we implemented a system to enter laboratory reports into a centralized searchable spreadsheet which allows better data management and tracking and implements uh, the OLA recommendations to review uh, our registry data for accuracy and completeness. So we believe that we have, um, in a couple of these areas, already uh, fully implemented the auditor's recommendations, and in many others we are working on it. Just last month, we implemented a policy to verify during the, the registration renewal process for patients that each manufacturer holds a valid contract with an independent laboratory for the purpose of testing medical cannabis. That recommendation also is, uh, we consider, fully implemented. Also just last month, we renewed the manufacturer registration agreements and added provisions uh, that each manufacturer provide the state read-only access to their seed-to-sale systems so that the Office of Medical Cannabis can monitor for activity suspect of diversion or inversion or lack of inventory control. Having this read-only access is a step forward. It's, it's a limited solution. It, it doesn't answer all of our issues with uh, the ability to do seed to sale tracking, for example, but it's a step forward in tracking and monitoring the cultivation, processing, testing, and sale processes. A single, sing, single seed to sale tracking system that would be used by the manufacturers and the state so that we'd all be using the same thing is one of the few established best practices that we see around the country in medical cannabis programs. Other states have this unified seed to sale tracking system. We do not. We think it's a good idea. Uh, we want to continue to, um, to work with uh, the legislature, the governor, uh, and the manufacturers to advance that idea of a, of a single unified seed to sale system. We are partnering with Minnesota IT services to improve the storage capacity of the current registry. Uh, and that upgrade is set for March of this year, which we think will go a long way to uh, improving storage of needed documentation uh, for, pa uh, for parents and guardians. Uh, starting in April of this year and then on a recurring basis, we will systematically review and verify that practitioners uh, licensed to approve patients continue to hold a valid license with the Board of Medical Practice. 
And in addition, we will amend, amend our administrative rules by the end of June to require practitioners to notify the department of changes in their license status or when they have uh, discon discontinued care for individual patients in the program. Uh, I think these two changes will be responsive to the issues raised by the auditor with respect to the ensuring that uh, provider practitioners' licenses uh, remain in good standing. We've made a lot of progress in improving internal controls this past year, but there certainly is still work to do. Several other recommendations made by the legislative auditor requ require additional changes to our existing registry or purchasing a, a more robust seed to sale software packages. We think these recommendations from the auditor have a lot of value, but will require further consultation with Minute uh, and, and with the legislature and additional funding for implementation. Um, but before uh, wrapping up, though, I do want to just spend a moment on the really the one issue where uh, I think we've interpreted interpreted excuse me statute differently than the auditor, and agree with the auditor that this really requires the legislature to weigh in on what was the intent, and that's around this issue for eligibility for reduced fees, and and for whom was that lower uh, fee intended? I, I think that the auditor has has. Um, has believed that the phrase medical assistance literally means the state's Medicaid program and, uh, and also the statutory reference to uh, uh, folks with d disability who are receiving Social Security benefits. We've interpreted the phrase medical assistance to be, to be broader. Um, other forms of providing medical aid to populations uh, struggling with access issues. So we have offered that reduced fee to disabled veterans receiving civilian health and medical program of the VA, or CHAMP VA, uh, and uh, as been pointed out, two disabled seniors who had previously received disability insurance but who have aged into retirement benefits. So we've, we've thought that was consistent with legislative intent. Um, Commissioner uh, and Malcolm, we're going to just hop for a moment. As soon as you're finished, uh, we're going to have uh, Senator Benson has a question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just about to wrap up. I just wanted and to point Senator out that uh, we, we do have a difference of interpretation there. And so based on that, you know, we want to explain our reasoning to you about why we've been uh, giving the reduced fee to a broader group of people and that it would be our intention uh, to continue doing that until the legislature clarifies uh, its, in, its intent. Uh, so that, uh, I think that pretty much is, is, is all I had, Madam Chair. So uh, happy to respond to your questions. Right. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. There, there have been several responses here where you agree in part and disagree in part. I really want to get to the other ones as well. But members, we're going to go ahead. And this is under finding, I think, number three in particular, if you want to look at it, on page three of the response from the department. So with that, I'll go with Senator Benson and then Senator Rust. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Malcolm. First of all, do you intend to have a policy bill or a, an appropriation request related to these findings in particular? Commissioner? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Benson, uh, yes, we've had sort of a placeholder um, in the queue on both the policy side and a supplemental budget request awaiting uh, this report. Okay, thank you. And Madam Chair? Senator Benson? I could, and Commissioner, um, I guess when we're looking at legislative intent, did you talk to any of the legislators that helped draft the bill? Because um, generally medical assistance is a specific term. And so um, we, we're not great at writing law, but we do it a lot. And when we say medical assistance, it usually means a, a specific yeah. program. Um, and so I'm going to have to review this statute, but I would be cautious about a broad interpretation of something that has a specific, it, we, the health committees talk about medical assistance all the time. Everybody around this table who's been on a health committee knows what medical assistance means when we say it, and it doesn't mean general medical aid. I think if the legislature wanted it interpreted more broadly, mm -hmm. they would have said Minnesota care. They would have, you know, they would have put in some federal poverty guideline number. And so I guess I'm not sure um, if anybody checked with the legislature before you started a broader interpretation. Commissioner? 
Madam Chair, Senator Benson, um, fair point. And I, uh, neither Chris nor I were, were uh, part of that discussion, so I'll have to do some research back at the department and see if there's any history of that consultation. I'm, I'm not aware of it. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I, I would say just in general, the debate and the discussion, I think the point made is medical assistance is a very specific program, and when it's used in statute, it is well defined and well understood, you know, what it is. So I'm speaking, again, just specifically to that. I don't know that that's subject to much interpretation. Uh, Senator Rest. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my um, um, concern is also with, with finding number three. And um, I'm recalling in the, some of the um, discussion we've had on findings in previous reports on DHS, from DHS, that somewhere along the line, a person decided, a person decided, here we have the department. Who was it? And if it was new, who was it? I mean, we have a right to expect people who are employees or agency heads to take personal responsibility for decisions and not have this um, anonymous, the department. And um, uh, it's been happening too much. And it's not that I think anybody should be fired or this or that and the other thing, but somebody should come forward and say, um, I read the words medical assistance, and here's what was my recommendation on what that meant, and we just then included it. Um, uh, at some point, the buck has to stop, and somebody has to come forward and say, uh, you might not like the decision I made, but I made it. And it's very disappointing uh, to find report after report and, and uh, that makes this kind of anonymous non-responsibility. And, and it's, I have respect to you a lot, but I, I don't respect what's happened here. And... Um, you know, people are talking about, this is a little bit off, and I'll be very quick, uh, about having uh, programs of recreational marijuana. We can't even do medical marijuana in a responsible way. Generally not adequate is a terrible finding, even our conclusion. And, um, uh, and to say with finding three in particular, as, as um, Senator Benson's already brought up, um, that the department did it. No, there was a person who made that decision. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to point my finger. <laughs> there was a person who made that decision, and we have a right to know who it was. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Chair. Rest. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, Commissioner, um, Ms. Bombach, I'm going to have a question for you on this particular few, if you can come on up too. But Commissioner, you want to respond to that and that we have a, um, a documentation within the Department of Health somewhere that has generated this interpretation. Can you uh, respond to that? Uh, Madam Chair uh, and Senator Rest, thank you again. I appreciate the point and I agree with that. I think uh, accountability for decisions is important and, and that is something I, I personally strongly agree with. I, I will certainly go back and do some research to see if there is documentation of, of when and how this decision was, was made, whether and how it was communicated or, or consulted. So I, I don't have that for you today. I think it's a very more than fair request, though, and um, certainly I take accountability for it today for the, uh, the decision that was, was made and we are still implementing. Um, so I, uh, uh, in terms of numbers uh, of folks that we're talking about here, I imagine Chris may know that or we could find it out for you in terms of what does this mean in terms of numbers of how many uh, disabled veterans, for example, or, uh, or folks who've, who've aged into retirement benefits. Uh, I don't know as I'm sitting here today, but Chris, maybe you do, how many people we're talking about? I do not, Madam Chair. Ms. Polk, uh, focus. Members. Um, I do not know the exact number, but we certainly can find that. I know that it's a relatively small number 
of our 18,000 patients. I, I, I will. I just want to clarify, the question is not about how many were served. That is not the question. It is helpful information, not the question. Senator Rest? Yes, and um, the, the, uh, the groups that you mentioned seem to me to be very deserving, and they should have been included in the, um, or at least discuss, discussed, mm -hmm. whether they should have been included in the original legislation. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with yep. who they are or what their needs are, it has to do with who was responsible for making the decision. Understood. Okay, Commissioner, so we make that just yeah. really clear. Ms. Bombaca, on this uh, topic as well, did you, in your um, work that you did with this particular program, uh, did you come across any documentation of the source of this interpretation that would be a little bit more specific than what we're hearing today? Um, Madam Chair, Ms. we Bombach. actually did request who made the decision, and we asked for a legal opinion, um, and we did not receive anything, and they, uh, the department was unable to provide us with any documentation. So, uh, Ms. Bombach, you asked this question of the Department of Health in the process of your conducting this audit? Madam Chair, that's correct. And you, when did you make that request? Uh, Madam Chair, I couldn't uh, give you the exact date, but it would have been something uh, that we asked early on as we were doing our work. And Just we an approximate month? Um, so I would say midsummer, maybe July, and I'm guessing on that. But I, I just want to clarify, we, ought, we actually did ask that question as part of our exit conferences and our final exit that we had in December, where we again asked, do you have a legal opinion? Um, that would have broadly interpreted medical assistance. And my statement is I've, I've been working in medical assistance. That's been my area for 22 years, and I've never heard that interpretation um, mm -hmm. that they've applied. And certainly um, any documentation that House Research has ever put out that says um, Chapter 256B relates to the federal Medicaid program um, conflicts with the department's interpretation. Thank you, Ms. Bombach, and that is generally in statute as well, that citation and that well-understood definition. So you asked us um, in last summer, you asked that question of the department or of the office, got no answer, and in the exit interview, you uh, asked again and have still got no answer. So, Commissioner, I want to tell you, um, there's significant issue here, uh, two things. One, what is... Uh, that responsible person or uh, whatever that was that we need to know about. And I would like to ask you to, um, to answer that question, but I'd also like to see the documentation, any documentation, emails, notes, whatever may be there that uh, we can have here with the Legislative Audit Commission members uh, to see that. And um, it's also disappointing that the Legislative Auditor, in a very timely way, asked that question and then eight months later, there about seven, eight months later, there still is no answer to that. Here we are asking for it as well. That's an issue of noncompliance with a legal entity, the Legislative Aud Auditor's Office. So uh, that's also very serious as well at not responding to that. Um, the next person I'll recognize is Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Malcolm, were rules promulgated to support this legislation? Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative Erickson, yes. And thank you, Madam Chair. Representative uh, how Erickson. many rules were promulgated? And in review of them, do you know whether or not those who wrote the rules listened to the hearings that occurred to bring this legislation to fruition? Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative Erickson, um, I would uh, ask Chris if she can give you more detail on the, the timeline of the rulemaking. OK, Ms. Tholkas. Uh, Madam Chair. And so I, the question, uh, Representative Erickson, would you just state it, restate your question for Ms. Tholkas? Well, I'm concerned about the rulemaking mm -hmm. process that would have, would, would, would have succeeded the uh, uh, enactment of this law and uh, whether or not the hearings of the committees were listened to as the rules were promulgated because that would tie into the medical assistance if that came up, uh, perhaps, anyway. Madam Chair, Representative Erickson. Ms. Erickson, Tholkas. 
Uh, yes, my understanding, I have been with this program since January of 2019. There are mm -hmm. a handful of staff that have been with the program for the duration, and my understanding is that, yes, they did listen to hearing the hearings and um, were observant of, of the, the dialogue that happened um, when and utilized that information during the rulemaking process. Okay. So, thank, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, can thank you, Ms. Ms. Bombeck, Bombeck, Ms. Can you Ms. Sarah, can you Erickson, confirm just that? give me a moment oh, to thank you, Ms. Tholkus. Representative Erickson, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Bombeck, were you aware of that as you proceeded with the audit? Um, Ms. Bombeck. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Erickson, we didn't review the whole rulemaking process, and I just want to clarify whether um, that is, in fact, in rule. Your interpretation is in rule. So, Ms. Bombach, are you asking that question of Ms. Tholkus, mm -hmm. if that interpretation is in rule? Madam Ms. Chair, uh, no, that interpretation is not in rule. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tholkus. I think it was an important question to clarify. Senator Benson. Um, I, I just looked up anything under 256B. <laughs> if it says medical assistance in Minnesota care, the medical assistance is lowercase Minnesota care is capitalized as is referenced in, on page 18, footnote number 32, which references this specifically. So even a cursory review of Minnesota statute would have said, oh, this means the medical assistance program under 256B. And so you need to stop this until you come to the legislature or get somebody in the legislature to say, you know what, this is what we actually meant. Um, I'm really tired of staff deciding to do with money what they believe is right, never writing it down, not checking with anybody. We're done. We're not doing this anymore. Commissioner Malcolm, you have done an exceptional job at the OHFC and getting things in right order there. Those behaviors need to be across departments in the state of Minnesota, and I don't mean to conflate MDH with DHS, but staff simply saying, oh, we think medical assistance means anybody who needs help doesn't look at a cursory review of any other place in statute where these two words fit together. Just please stop this so we can stop having fights about things that should just be settled in the legislature. Madam Chair, Senator Benson. Um, Ms. Baumbach. Um, I just want to clarify, in fact, within the department, this program statute elsewhere, it actually does reference that medical assistance in Minnesota care refers to the programs under 256B and 256L. So it actually is referenced elsewhere in that section. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Commissioner, um, I'll call on you next to respond. Uh, but I, in general, in this kind of a situation when there's a disagreement here about, quote, whether there was even any legal right to interpret because medical assistance is a very clearly well-defined program, not subject to interpretation. Uh, it's well understood law. And in that situation, once you become aware uh, of that, uh, I think the really proper way to do it is to stop doing it until the legislature tells you specifically yes and then make that case. I'm hearing from Ms. Thokas that this is not a high number of population, um, I think, who work that through. Many of them are already, you know, we're not going to take away what they don't, what if they already have it, but to stop doing it anymore. And I think the legislature will be open to doing this sort of thing, but I think that's the proper way to handle it. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I, I just want to make it clear that I'm, I hear you. Um, I understand the, the broader policy concern and process concern that you're raising. Um, and again, I think it, your, your points and your concerns are, are well taken. Uh, we will take this back. We will, we will see what, what we can discern. Uh, my apologies to the auditor if we weren't fully responsive uh, about those questions. Um, I, I, all I can tell you is that we'll, we'll go back and, and take a look and see if there's anything more in our records that we can provide to you by way of clarification. Um, but what matters going forward is that we understand your, uh, your concern and, and, sh and it, it, uh, we'll, we'll do our absolute best to, to make sure we tighten up this very kind of process. So Commissioner, I'm gonna to go to Representative Hansen, but I just wanna mention that 
uh, two issues here. One uh, is very, very specific in regards to those fees. The other one is who and that documentation. So yes. we're clear about that. We're not losing track of that. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question's on kind of looking at something a little different, and that's the, mm -hmm. the signing of the contracts to check that the, the companies were under contract. And it seems to me when we, when we were debating the establishment of the program, uh, one of the conditions was is that these companies would be able to be organized, is that they would be, uh, that there was a labor component uh, to make sure that they would be organized. And um, I'm checking if that was part of the contract or if there was any component to that. And I, I could be wrong, my, it's, mm -hmm. my memory could be a little fuzzy, but it seems that that was a, a discussion at least of, of whether they are unionized, um, if the workers have the ability to form a bargaining unit, um, and if that is a box that's checked on the contract, if that was one of the requirements. And again, I may be wrong on the final version. I remember that discussion, but uh, the, the delay in signing the contracts, how that, what that contract uh, is related to, and just your oversight as the office of, you know, do you check with D uh, Dolly or the Department of Labor and Industry is there cross uh, communication between health and that on if that requirement is there? Commissioner. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Hansen, thanks for that question. We'll, we'll, we'll have to get back to you with, on the specifics. Uh, we're aware that at least one of the manufacturers does have a, uh, 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 an organized workforce. Uh, I don't know, um, without going back to research it, whether that's a contractual requirement and, and whether and how we've worked with labor and industry. So we'll get back to you on that, sir. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that um, I think there was some mention here about the program expanding and growing and doing all those things and uh, consideration of that. But I would also say consideration means at the same time you are expanding and making a decision to take on new areas, which in itself puts a burden. So when you consider the fact that right now you have the um, uh, the, these serious concerns and the lack of controls on it, that's not the time to expand. You ought to be getting this well handled, get your registries, and that ought to be the focus. And so you're kind of creating your own situation by expanding uh, the, the who can have access to the program and doing that. And then also when you um, don't have the um, internal controls at the same time, um, that also puts the uh, two companies at risk. Uh, in your uh, Ms. Bombach and the testimony we've heard today, realizing that you, the, if those internal controls had been in place, this manufacturer wouldn't have had one of those issues. So these internal controls are really important to the sustainability of the program. And so I think not expanding while you have your hands full getting a hold of this, not putting manufacturers at risk by not doing those internal controls and all those things are very, very important. So I would caution expanding while you have this situation uh, within the Office of Medical Cannabis. All right, so that's just a comment there. Uh, with that, members, if there's not anything more, we do have another report we'd like to get to. And so, uh, Commissioner, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bomba. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thorkis, for being here as well. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, um, I want to thank you for that uh, discussion. I think uh, the next report that we have, frankly, raises a similar issue. And I don't want to preempt too much what Ms. Uh, Lyson is going to say. Uh, but you will find here again uh, with this program, which is uh, a program, frankly, that you may not be all that familiar with. It is a program that the uh, legislature started to fund in 2014 by appropriating money, uh, $4.5 million, to the University of Minnesota to form a partnership with Mayo Clinic to advance regenerative medicine in Minnesota. And I think we would all agree this is really an incredibly important aspect of modern medicine, and Minnesota certainly wants to 
to participate in a very um, significant way in uh, the development of regenerative medicine. But our concern, and Ms. Lyson is going to talk about this, is that you enacted a law, and I might reference you to, and she will as well, that the, that the law itself is uh, in, the, in our report. It is uh, a fairly uh, short uh, piece of legislation. It's on page 21. And so in our first finding, Ms. Lyson is going to talk about the fact that you were very specific in the law in enumerating what you wanted the University and Mayo Clinic to spend this money on. And one of our findings is that they took a broader interpretation. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. I, I would just say in general, we feel that one of our functions as legislative auditors is to really have agencies do what you have said today, and that is give strict adherence to the letter of the law. And we even have a canon of interpre interpreting laws that says if the law is clear on its face, you should not create a pretext for implementing the law by what you think was the intent or the spirit of the law. Go by the letter of the law. And so with that, um, Madam Chair and members, I want to turn to Lori Lyson, who was the director manager of our uh, audit of regenerative medicine, Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Noble. So we'll get to you, Ms. Lyson. I just wanted to say I really appreciated that quote in that section of law so much that could you send that out to us so yes. we can uh, include that in our record? Because I think that is really the essence. And if it's already a state law, I think even more importantly then. Yes. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Lyson, you can go ahead. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Lori Lyson. I'm the Audit Director in the Financial Audit Division. This audit was performed by Heather Rodriguez, Tracia Polden, and Paul Reshu. Regenerative Medicine Minnesota, which I will refer to as RMM going forward, was created to bring Minnesota to the forefront of regenerative medicine. In law, the structure includes a collaborative partnership between the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic. A five-member board was created to provide oversight of the program. The two co-chairs are the Dean of the University of Minnesota Medical School and the Director of the Mayo Clinic Center for Regenerative Medicine. Per law, two of the five members are not affiliated with the University of Minnesota or the Mayo Clinic. Funding began in fiscal year 2015 and is used primarily for grants. Funds are not used for administrative or monitoring expenses. Our audit included testing of the grant process. The grant process begins with proposal evaluations. RMM has a pool of approximately 120 independent evaluators who cannot work for the University of Minnesota or the Mayo Clinic. Additionally, these evaluators must have sub subject matter expert in regenerative medicine and reside outside of Minnesota. The next step in the grant process is the awarding of grants. RMM compiles the evaluator scores on a central spreadsheet, and based on the evaluator scores, the board makes funding decisions. Grant monitoring wraps up the grant process. The university and the university's co-chair oversees the grant reimbursements, and the board reviews interim and annual reports. We conducted this audit in response to allegations of mismanagement within the RMM partnership, and additionally, our office has not previously performed an audit of this program. Our audit objectives for grant proposal evaluation and awarding include, did RMM develop adequate controls to objectively evaluate proposals and award grants, and did RMM evaluate proposals against its established criteria and fund top scoring proposals? Our objectives over grant award oversight include, did RMM develop adequate controls to ensure that funded projects met deliverable and expected outcome, and did RMM partnership only reimburse allowable project cost? The legislature provided 4.5 million of funding in fiscal 15 and 4.35 million in subsequent years. This is an open and standing appropriation. Our audit scope went from the inception of RMM, fiscal 15, through February of fiscal 19. 
The table on this slide shows grant activity for fiscal years 2015 through March of 2018. At the time of our audit, no grants awarded in fiscal 19 had incurred expenses. In the area of internal controls, we concluded that internal controls were generally not adequate to safeguard the assets and ensure compliance with applicable legal requirements. Our audit identified internal control weaknesses related to proposal evaluation, project awards, and grant project oversight. In the area of legal compliance, we concluded that RMM generally did not comply with finance-related legal requirements, specifically in the areas of awarding grants not authorized in state law, non-compliance with conflict of interest policies, and grant proposals receiving unequal scrutiny. For finding one, we determined that RMM spent some of its state appropriation on grants that the law did not authorize. The appropriation law states that money can be spent in the areas of regenerative medicine research, clinical translation, and commercialization. As, Jim, as uh, Auditor Noble's reference, page 21 of the report does have the appropriation law language. Since the law did not define these terms, we use guidance from the National Institutes of Health, which is the framework used by the partnership. The RMM partnership established four categories that differ from those defined in law, which include research, education, biobusiness development, and clinical care. We do not believe RMM complied with the law when it awarded 58 educational grants totaling 2.46 million, which is 23% of all grants awarded during the period covered by our audit. Specifically, we question RMM's decision to make 30 K through 12 grants totaling 441,000. Money for these K through 12 grants went to fund activities such as STEM camps and the creation of workbooks. We believe the language of the law is clear and unambiguous. Our recommendations are that RMM should only issue grants for activities authorized in law and that RMM partners should seek a law change if they want to continuing, continue awarding educational grants. For finding two, we identified one evaluator who had a conflict of interest. As noted earlier, evaluators must reside outside of Minnesota, cannot work for the university or the Mayo Clinic, and must have subject matter expertise. We believe there was a partial control in place, which includes RMM sending a list to potential evaluators, those grant applicants and project personnel to identify whether they have any potential conflicts. However, during our testing, the evalu during our testing, we identified one of six biobusiness evaluators with a conflict of interest. This evaluator was named as a staff member on one of the biobusiness grant proposals being evaluated. RMM removed this evaluator from reviewing the proposal in which the evaluator was named as a staff member. However, the evaluator was still permitted to serve in an evaluator role for competing proposals in that same category. Five of the proposals reviewed by this evaluator were not awarded funding and received the five lowest scores. However, the proposal that the evaluator was named in received funding. Our recommendation is that RMM partners should not let evaluators score proposals if they have an affiliation with other competing proposals. For finding three, we saw that grant proposals did not always receive the same level of scrutiny. With the exception of K through 12 proposals, it is RMM's goal to have proposals re reviewed by three evaluators. However, RMM mentioned that at times it's difficult to secure three evaluators, and at other times evaluators are assigned but do not complete the review process. In fiscal, in fiscal 18, we saw that 32% of discovery science research proposals received two evaluations, whereas the remaining 68% received three evaluations. All, grants went, all grant awards went to proposals receiving only two evaluations. Having the same number of evaluations helps ensure that the partnership treats grant applicants fairly, which minimizes the risk of individual rater bias. Our recommendation here is that the partners should ensure that all grant proposals receive a consistent review. For finding four, 
we identified two proposals that due to calculation errors erroneously received errors or awards for 250,000 each. RMM compiles all evaluator scores and these scores are used, they use the National Institute of Health rating system. Um, they compile those scores into a master list and work with the university co-chair to determine which projects to recommend for funding. The RMM board reviews the scores and recommendations before finalizing awards. We found errors in the process used to aggregate these evaluator scores and make grant funding decisions. For example, in 2016, RMM used an incorrect formula to calculate the final scores for grant proposals. The board erroneously funded a 250,000 proposal, which prevented funding of a competing proposal with higher evaluator scores. In fiscal 2018, a similar situation occurred, leading the board to reject a $250,000 proposal that should have been funded. Our recommendation here is that, re that RMM partners should conduct a comprehensive review of the process used to compile grant proposal scores for decision making. For finding five, we identified that grant, grant contracts for Mayo Clinic awards differed from those of other institutions. The University of Minnesota prepares formal grant contracts for all awards to external entities, which includes the Mayo Clinic. Additionally, RMM performs a risk assessment on all external entities receiving a grant for more than $25,000. During our testing, we saw that grant agreements for Mayo Clinic awards were less restrictive than other external grant agreements. Specifically, language in the Mayo Clinic agreements gave the clinic the ability to charge cost up to, to co um, charge cost to grants up to 90 days before the award begins, and the ability to change the approved grant budget categories as long as there was no change to the overall project budget or scope. These terms were from the National Institutes of Health Policy on prior approvals. RMM stated that the terms for the Mayo Clinic were less restrictive due to the Mayo posing a lower risk. However, in our review of risk assessments performed, we did not see any external entities that were classified as high risk. Grant agreements are an important control because they outline all expectations and responsibilities related to awards. Our finding here is that RMM partners should standardize terms in grant contracts. In finding six, external grant reimbursements lack sufficient documentation and one grant reimbursement included on allowable cost. When external grantees submit reimbursement requests, university staff and the university co-chair review the request to validate cost and ensure that they were allowable that they did not exceed the total award amount, that they were within the approved period, and included the correct indirect cost rate. RMM requires that request include current and cumulative project cost along with a certification to the truth and accuracy of the information. Our testing confirmed that none of the grantees received reimbursements that exceeded their award amount and that grantees used the correct indirect cost rate. However, we could not validate the appropriateness of other costs because the university does not require documentation such as invoices. A documentation submitted request varies significantly from one grantee to another. Armin stated it would be administratively burdensome on the grantee to request more su supporting documentation, and RMM believes there is a minimal risk of grantees seeking re reimbursement for unallowable cost. However, without a more thorough review process, it will not be possible to verify that grantees appropriately use state money. Additionally, in our testing, we saw that the university reimbursed 6,454 of costs that the grantee incurred before the start of the award period. The grant agreement did not include language that allowed this type of reimbursement. Our recommendations are that RMM partners should outline documentation requirements that will support the ability to validate the allowability of cost and that RMM partners should seek recovery of the costs that were inappropriately paid to one grantee. In our final finding, we identify that the board members do not consistently review interim and final reports. RMM partners rely on grantees to validate that, validate that projects are achieving their desired outcomes. Grantees must submit a final report at the conclusion of their project that describes the work done and the results. 
For two-year research grants, which account for 70% of total dollars, grantees also must submit an interim progress report at the end of the first year. Additionally, we were told that the board reviews all interim reports. However, we found evidence that only 37% of interim reports were reviewed by the board. We were told that the university board co-chair reviews all final reports. However, other board members do not consistently review those final reports. Reports are an important tool to assess whether grant money was well spent. Grant oversight controls can be strengthened by spending more time at board meetings to discuss interim and final reports. Our recommendation is that RMM should review all interim and final progress reports. Madam Chair, I'm open for any questions if you have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lyson. Mm -hmm. Members, uh, do you have questions? If not, we'll go to having regenerative medicine. We'll do that, okay? okay. Is that okay? All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So who is going to be here today? Um, uh, Ms. Kratz, are you going to? Okay. I don't know you by face. I just know I heard that. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome, Ms. Kratz. Mm -hmm. Just introduce yourself and then go ahead and present. My name is Susan Kratz. I am the Academic Health Counsel uh, for the University of Minnesota. I am here on behalf of the University of Minnesota, which is one of the partners in the collaborative partnership between uh, the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic on the regenerative medicine uh, program. And as you will see, uh, the RMM partnership has submitted a response to the audit report. I am happy to highlight uh, the areas that we disagree with, if that would be helpful to the subcommittee, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Kratz. I would say that in general, if you follow along with, uh, do you have a copy of the report there? And in the back is the RMM's uh, response. And it's very helpful to us uh, if you just follow through that and want to make verbal comments to highlight things that may already be in the letter, but you want to highlight them? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, as the uh, RMM partnership, and specifically the University of Minnesota and Mayo, have a disagreement with the Office of the Legislative Auditor with respect to how to interpret the law. Um, the RMM partnership has, since the beginning of this time, always in good faith believed that the law establishes a three-part mission for the Regenerative Medicine Minnesota partnership. And that three-part mission is outlined in paragraph A of the law. In fact, since 2014, Regenerative Medicine Minnesota has been dutifully performing its work in carrying out that three-part mission and has been transparently showing its work to the legislature and to the Office of the Legislative Auditor in 2017, specifically including the education grants that have been awarded um, during that time period pursuant to the law. Um, we are concerned that the Office of the Legislative Auditor is now substituting its judgment for how to read that law for what the will of the legislature was in, um, in that law. And um, I think it is important to understand that the uh, law has a number of paragraphs. The particulars of the Office of Legislative Auditors uh, report relates to a phrase that is contained in paragraph A of the law, which as noted in the attachment um, to the Legislative Auditors report provides that the appropriation is from the general fund for the direct and indirect expenses of the collaborative partnership between the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic 
for regenerative medicine research, clinical translation, and commercialization. The RMM partnership has always understood that that is the purpose and mission of the RMM partnership. And in fact, if you continue to read that paragraph, it goes next then into who is going to serve on the RMM partnership. So it's the University of Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic, and then we have representatives of private industry and others with expertise in regenerative medicine research, clinical translation, commercialization, and medical venture financing. It is important to also note then that if you go to paragraph C of that law, the law says that the full amount of the appropriation is for the partnership. The only exception on how money cannot be used is in paragraph C, which says that the full amount of the appropriation is for the partnership and may not be used by the University of Minnesota for administrative or monitoring expenses. That's the only express exception of how the money can be used. So in good faith, the RMM partners have been carrying out its work um, consistent with the three-part mission of the partnership, which includes issuing the types of grants that are identified in the Office of the Legislative Auditor's report. It is not only our uh, belief that the law, if it is unambiguous and clear, is in fact that that phrase is about the purpose of the partnership and not an enumeration of grant categories. Even if there is a question about that, if we look at the legislative history, um, the transparency of the reports that have been submitted in accordance with the law to the legislature that clearly identify that education grants have been given, as well as the public nature of uh, the annual meetings, uh, the website, and all of the things that are available to show that education grants are part of how the RMM partnership advances its mission is extremely transparent and there has never, ever been um, a suggestion that the RMM partners have not been fulfilling the intent of the legislature or the language of the law. Ms. Ms. Kratz, do you have more? Otherwise, uh, maybe we'll just take a moment, Senator Benson, yeah. to ask a question or a comment. Madam Chair, I was reading, and we get these reports as chairs, and I'm, I'm trying to, re I try to read everything that comes across my desk, and I'm sure I received them and missed this, um, but that does not, it, it's a failure on my part for not have paid attention to the fact that these grants are using being used to support scrubs camps. I, my kids went to STEM camp. I think STEM camps are great, but I don't see how it fits under research, clinical translation, or commercialization. So I didn't do my due diligence as I started receiving these reports, and so I want to, you know, partially own the fact that this got away from the legislature. Um, but given that this was in a higher ed bill, I, I struggle with the K-12 applicability, and if we're gonna broadly interpret, then would um, repaying loans for people working on research be a suitable grant? If we're gonna, so I, I believe in this work, I tried to check with the author of this bill to see if there was something missed or something in testimony. Um, I think it's not that I have a fundamental problem with the grants, it's that I don't, I don't know how K-12 STEM camps fit 
under research, translation, or commercialization. This is where I struggle. And that these reports came across my desk and I didn't catch that, is a, is, that's on me. Um, and I'm sorry. And, and I don't want to blow this up, but I think the legislature could say this can be used for training or talent development. If that's what we mean, then let's say it. Um, these are not necessarily bad things to spend money on. They are not being misappropriated. Um, I'm just, I, and again, I didn't get a hold of the legislature, legislator who carried this bill um, because we, we talk about talent acquisition and, and we want to build this in Minnesota. It's really important for the future of our overall healthcare ecosystem that we continue to be innovative in this space, have the right workforce, have the right infrastructure, and have a welcoming, productive environment. So I want to keep that in place. And so my criticisms are as much of myself as they are of the RMM. Um, so I hope we can resolve this in a way that respects the importance of the work that is being done, but also has the legislature doing their job, especially me, perhaps a little bit better. Thank you, Senator Benson. I think many times, though, we, ha we always start as a legislature that when we've written a law that we expect that the responsible entities will read the law and comply with it. One of the challenges is, and I think this is what Mr. Nobles uh, referenced a little bit, is because you have a good idea doesn't mean that the law allows you to use that money for that good idea. And so once you have it in statute, regenerative medicine research, clinical translation, commercialization, those other ideas, either you come back to the legislature and ask to expand, or you use other monies for what may be a, uh, a, a good thing to do. We don't disagree with that. But um, I would agree with Senator Benson's assessment. How does this uh, really tie into that, not saying that it isn't a worthy goal? And so I have on the list here uh, Representative Erickson, uh, Senator Rest, and then Representative Hansen. Uh, so Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Ms. Kratz, uh, thank you for being here. My questions, of course, deal with the education grants, since I've served on that committee for numerous years, uh, both a policy and finance, and have never been given a report in regard to these grants. So were they run through the Department of Education? Was the department involved at all? Were these competitive grants? Uh, to whom were they given? I think you owe this subcommittee a report of the outcomes. First of all, the expended, who, who was granted this, this money? Uh, how was it used? What were the outcomes? Uh, we need to see a full report of that 441,000 and also the other uh, 2 million plus that comprises all the other education grants. Uh, because I'm not aware, serving on finance, of any of this. Uh, and like Senator Benson, I read all reports, but I think I really read the reports uh, very uh, uh, responsibly uh, when they have to do with K-12. Now, this may have run through some other agency, I don't know, but uh, could you address these issues that I've raised? Ms. Kranz. Madam Chair, Representative Erickson, the specifics of the grants, uh, we, I, I don't have that with me, but we can certainly provide you with that information. It is also available on the Regenerative Medicine Minnesota website, but I, we will certainly um, follow up and provide the information that you're looking for. As far as the, um, the uh, reporting on all of the grants that are made by Regenerative Medicine Minnesota, under the appropriation law, there is a requirement that the uh, RMM partnership provide a audited report to the legislature uh, every two years. And so uh, the reports that have been received by the legislature were received in 2017 and 2019, and they covered all of the grants issued by the partnership with line items for the specific grants. So those, um, those audits uh, went to, were addressed to the chairs and ranking minority members of uh, Senate and House committees having jurisdiction over higher education and economic development. So I think that's, but we can provide you with a copy of those audited reports as well. And uh, they were submitted in accordance with the, the um, language of the law. Madam Chair. 
Uh, Representative Erickson. But these are K-12 education grants. And so they did not come to, as I heard you say, to anyone who serves on K-12. And if these are grants to K-12 institutions, to our schools, uh, or to other that are related to K-12, we should have received those reports as well, even if they were steered through higher ed. Uh, so I, I am, am very upset that the, this was not brought to my attention when I was serving on these committees or even chaired policy for four years in a row. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Senator Rest. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am really intrigued by the um, response and how uh, detailed it is, how many times the words in good faith are used. Uh, and um, um, it seems to me, um, well, I look particular. I'll look at one point um, about uh, claiming about the uh, complaining about legislative grammar. That's um, that that's dear to my heart. I'm sure it is to yes. <laughs> uh, Representative mm -hmm. Erickson's. But nevertheless, um, on uh, on page five, you mentioned that. Um, the legislature accepted emphasis for mine, the reports without raising questions. Uh, did you interpret the, the fact that um, the, a report was sent to um, Senator Benson to mean that she approved of it? Ms. Kratz. <laughs> Chairwoman uh, and Senator Rust, uh, we're not saying there's any approval of okay. a report that was sent. I think that's, thank you, Ms. Kratz, that's Senator Rest. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think that's important because we know um, uh, as we work with organizations and um, uh, we serve on boards and we are asked uh, to uh, approve minutes of a, bill, of a meeting to indicate that uh, the board itself um, verifies that the actions that are in the minutes are indeed ones that they take responsibility for. But with regard to financial reports, they're never approved. <laughs> they're only received um, because individual members on the board and the board itself um, does not have the obligation, nor should it, to um, uh, know all the details of a financial report verified that they can indeed approve it. So um, most conscientious uh, financial officers or treasurers or whatever never ask for a report to be uh, approved, uh, a financial report to be approved. On the other hand, I believe that uh, this entire response is a blueprint to the legislature on how to change the law. Uh, there are suggestions after suggestions after suggestions that say uh, they did this, the legislative auditor is wrong in how it interpreted um, the legislature's intent. So let's, the legislature and the appropriate committee, Senator Benson, uh, um, Representative uh, Erickson, um, Look this over, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it's the legislature's response, responsibility to correct the law so that it accurately reflects um, the, the responsibilities, the intents. Clearly, it's not, it is not there right now. It is just not there. And um, uh, I, um, uh, I don't serve on those committees, but I... I respect good language use that reflects intent, yes. that um, reflects um, accuracy of, um, of what we think responsibility should be. And um, we don't usually get that in a uh, critique of the OLA's report. And we have a wonderful opportunity now here for the, um, uh, for the legislature to make sure that Everyone is on the same page of the, of the statute, that we get everything in order, we get the commas right, we decide whether we're going to use the Oxford comma or not, um, 
we can talk about antecedents. Yes. I mean, that's dear to my heart. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's get this yeah. particular section of the law perfectly in order in terms of grammar. Um, in that because words matter. They do. Clearly they matter because they went on and on and on about it. And if you think I am speaking sarcastically, I You're am not. not. <laughs> I mean and every thank word. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rest, Senator Benson. As a freshman, I served on the Health and Human Services Committee with Senator Higgins, and she she would have straightened this out if she had seen this legislation, I have no doubt. Um, so my question as I'm as I'm reading this letter, because there's no comma between translation and and, does that mean clinical translation and clinical commercialization? Would that be the proper Modifier. I don't even know what clinical commercialization would be. Senator Rest. Punctuation. Perhaps. Um, and so, okay. I, Senator I, Benson. Madam Chair, I, I don't mean to to speak over you, but this this letter has gone to an extraordinary length um, to correct something that that could have been corrected in perhaps a less aggressive way um, through conversation and understanding that there might be good intent, but we just need to be clear about what we, what we mean. Um, you know, the author's intent, testimony given in higher ed committees, if they said, and I wasn't on the higher ed committee, if they said, you know what, we should do STEM grants at high schools, then okay, the legislature talked about it as part of passing this law. So let's, we don't, I appreciate this level of detail. It would be good guidance for the people who revise this law going forward. Um, but I think the legislature being more precise with our words is, is good counsel. Uh, thank you, Senator Benson. I would also say, though, that Mr. Nobles uh, discussed this before. On the face of the law, uh, this concept of interpreting, whether it's medical assistance or other things, because it is seen as this would be really good. That is a problem that we're seeing all over the place. And so general interpretation, very specific interpretation of statute is on the face of it, what does the law say? It was very clear in those words. Uh, it didn't even use the word education, it used the word research. Mm -hmm. And so on the face of it, on the law, um, Representative Hansen, I'm going to call on you next. I just wanted to get in one little thing because I think sometimes folks come and they aren't as comfortable with the audit um, process that we go through here. There's a financial audit, which means uh, did the numbers add up, so on and so forth, and you do that. Then there's a program audit. Program means should you have spent that money in that way or in that case? because a financial audit came through and uh, that is just a simple report, doesn't mean approval or anything like that. And the same thing is because a program statement came through and because it was not objected to, doesn't mean it was approved. And I think that's a really important core consideration of what the work we do here and um, on the face of it in regards to the law. But for me, it's on the um, very first page of the letter which says, after a six-year history of collaboration and good faith, we believe it is unfair for the OLA to now substitute its judgment for how our education institutions should partner together to carry RMM's mission. Uh, first of all, an audit by its very face is you go back, you look back, and you assess. You cannot do it forward. You go back. That's the whole point of an audit. And it's not unfair at all. To go back in an audit, that's what an audit is, whether it's a program audit or a financial audit. And um, the OLA has an excellent reputation here in the legislature um, for not substituting judgment. What they do is do the numbers add up, and with the legislation, does it match what has been done in the program? And they have an excellent reputation at being very faithful and true to that. Um, at not substituting its judgment, but on the face of it and comparing all of that. So I found that particular sentence um, very interesting uh, at taking issue with something 
that anybody who does audits would know. That's the whole point. You look back and check it and see. So with that, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I, I find these meetings interesting because I'm not on these committees. And so when I, when I first was opening up the, the report, I thought I was dealing with a health care report. And then as I read more, it was a higher ed. And then it turned out we found our way into K-12 education. I, so it was an interesting journey um, listening to this. When I look at the, the statute, I could see um, that education is part of informing the public of the research that they paid for. And so I have a couple questions of, um, is there a website for the regenerative medicine? I mean, is the, is the research that is paid for by the public under a statutory obligation, is that easily accessible to the public where we can see, or what Minnesotans can see what they paid for? Okay, we have that question. Um, let's see. Ms. Madam, Lyson or? Madam Chair, okay, Ms. Representative Kratz? Hansen, yes. Mm -hmm. The answer sure. is yes. Regenerative Medicine Minnesota has a website uh, that lists all of the grants that have been awarded as well as the reports of how, uh, of the programs that were funded. Uh, Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, and so the research that's done um, and that's all in the public domain. It can be replicated. There's not a, um, are there patents that are provided uh, by, or the are research. the researchers able to patent that for the, themselves? I'm just wondering, um, maybe that question first. Okay, Ms. Kratz, do you want to answer that? Madam Chair, Representative Hansen, I would have to get more information for you on that. I don't know the details of that specific, um, so I'm not, so I'm not able to answer that, but we can get that information for you. Representative Hanson. And finally, Madam Chair, so um, having been in other sectors of mm -hmm. state government, we've spent a huge amount of time on what are direct and what are indirect costs and mm -hmm. outdoor heritage, LCCMR, all these things. And so I know in the past we've had the internal controls, you know, discussion about overall, but this indirect cost question I mean, it seems there's precedent for that elsewhere in other parts of, of state government. Um, the board members that are there, I think, and I just see this with a number of board members, and particularly if they're living busy lives and have other jobs, it, it just seems to me it'd be good to have a citizen or two on boards that are the person who says, you know, this isn't my field, mm -hmm. but what does this mean and how... Uh, how is this applicable to me as regular Minnesotan? Um, how do, how does it, what does it mean? How can you get there? And maybe the, a regular Minnesotan on the, on the board would say, I, I'm not sure what, why we're funding STEM education through this mechanism in a statutory application. Every group loves statutory appropriations because that means they don't come back to us. And maybe people forget that that autopilot is on. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think sometimes sunsets are good, uh, mm -hmm. and that leads to a, a, a reevaluation to see how things can be modified in the future. So, um, again, a fascinating report, uh, somewhat disturbing, um, but I think it gives an opportunity for all of us to learn. We have to pay attention uh, mm -hmm. to these things, all of us. And is it are we doing the right thing with the right money at the right time? Thank you, Representative Hansen. Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Kratz, uh, what was the appropriation amount in 2014 and how much has been appropriated since? So the um, initial appropriation um, was, I would have to take a look at that, but for fiscal year 2016 and thereafter, it's four point Three five million. Um, it was four point five, I believe, in twenty fourteen, and it's and then starting twenty sixteen. Now it's four million three hundred fifty thousand. I think that's. Thank you, Ms. Kratz. We're getting agreement from other folks as well. So I think we've uh, had a great discussion, members, and and I would say, Ms. Kratz, I think that um, as you heard the report before and today 
that on the face of it and uh, to really uh, steer clear of, quote, interpretations or good ideas that go beyond um, the face of it that is in statute, um, I think is a very important consideration for uh, Regenerative Medicine Minnesota to uh, take a fresh look after these six years and this report. And uh, we want to um, continue, we regenerative medicine very much so, but it is regenerative medicine, not regenerative education, it's regenerative medicine. And so focusing on many times uh, the piece that this particular statute is working to address has to do with research, clinical, and also then commercialization. So the expectation is those three things would be the primary focus. And um, some of these other things may be worthy, um, but I think um, this particular pot of money, the reason why the legislature wanted to fund it was for those three reasons and to help make sure that those fundings continue. Um, staying true to that, I think, would be something, even if you think that it may be a good idea to do K-12 or some other things that may be a tighter focus on what is actually in statute is something that maybe might be a board retreat or a, a, a serious discussion in regards to all of that. I would encourage you in that direction. And I would suspect that this may appear in committee structures, whether it's education or health and human services. I sit on health and human services, and certainly with this kind of report, um, we'll be keeping an eye on that, and I know other future reports will be given greater scrutiny. It's just a matter of it, when you're using taxpayer dollars, we are responsible and accountable um, for that in our duties as the legislature. So members, without further discussion and with all that, Ms. Kratz, would you like to make a closing remark? Or Mr. Nobles? Ms. Kratz? Madam Chair, other members here today, we just thank you for having us come and present our, our uh, response. Um, and I do want to just reiterate that the partnership has been a faithful steward of the legislative intent. I understand the message that, that is being sent. Um, but we want to just make sure that you understand that there was always the intent to follow the plain language of the law. Thank you very much, Ms. Kratz. Mr. Nobles? Madam Chair, members, I just want to again thank you for this hearing. Uh, thank the university for responding uh, to the report. Um, I, rather than take up time now, Madam Chair, I'm going to send members of the Legislative Audit Commission and all members of the legislature an update on all of the other audits and evaluations and special reviews that we have in process. You will be receiving a fair number of reports from us in February and early March. So I'll put that in paper and send that out to all the members. Thank you very much, Mr. Nobles. Uh, members, with that, our business concluded. We are adjourned.